Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? The volumes are good? Okay. Uh, my name is Charles Eckel. I'm one of the uh, developer evangelists within DevNet, and I'm here to talk to you today about OpenStack. Uh, how many of you are already pretty familiar with OpenStack? Okay. That, that's actually good, because this is a, a pretty introductory um, talk. The main thing I want you to, I guess, take away from this is for you to understand what OpenStack is and really kind of demystify for you um, what it takes to get you know, start using OpenStack so that you feel comfortable like, oh, I not only understand kind of what people say it is, but I know how to start it up, I know how to run it, I know how to play around with it, I know how to spin up VMs, uh, those types of things, so that I think that really starts to impress on you some of the power of it, just how easy it is for you to set up, tear down your own networks, and uh, do things that a, uh, an administrator of, of a cloud would want to do or a user of a cloud would want to do. So the way the agenda is laid out, we'll spend a bit of time talking about what is OpenStack, and then go into some typical use cases and workloads where OpenStack would be used. Then I'm going to talk to you a bit about a containerized version of OpenStack, because that's actually what I'll be deploying today, and I'll give you pointers to uh, how you could deploy that yourselves. And we'll talk a bit about how it works and also why, like why use containers for your OpenStack deployment. Uh, then I'm going to walk through how you can install it on your own laptop. Hopefully, after this talk, you'll be excited and want to go off and do that. So I'll give you all the pointers to uh, let you do step-by-step -step exactly what I'm doing here. And the additional resources will include that, plus some other information you can look at uh, that we have about all the good stuff going on about, uh, with OpenStack and with open source in general at Cisco. Okay, so with that, let's dive right into what is OpenStack. So I think of OpenStack as really just being a large collection of software that uh, can provide you a, a platform on which you can uh, deploy and operate um, public and private clouds. The, the real power of it is that it abstracts away from you all of the uh, resources that you would typically find in a data center. So in a data center, you're likely to find compute uh, resources and storage resources and networking resources. So it takes all of those resources, abstracts them behind a common API that you can use to interact with all those resources. Uh, perhaps somewhat more importantly, it, uh, it, it provides you with a portal that you can go into and as an administrator, you can administer your whole cloud and all the resources within it or you can also like carve off a chunk of resources that you're going to give to a particular user or group. So we'll, we'll go through how you would create a project within OpenStack, how you would create users and uh, assign resources to them, and then how they would go and spin up their own workloads within that. And then the thing I really want to impress on you, I guess, is the, the APIs behind OpenStack. I mentioned uh, this common set of APIs. The power of the APIs, uh, the, the, is that uh, that's what we'll be using when we interact with the portal. We're using the OpenStack APIs under the covers. When we go to the CLI, we're using the OpenStack APIs. And all those same APIs are available to you if you were to, say, uh, write some Python code that's going to make REST calls. It, they're all available to you. So now you can think about things that you would have typically done where you say, hey, I want to start a new application, deploy a new application in our company. What are we going to have to do? We're going to have to buy some servers. We're going to have to get them racked and stacked. We're going to have to have someone you know, set up the whole network for it. All this is going to take a lot of time. Well, with these APIs, you can actually do it instantaneously, programmatically, uh, and in, a, in an automated fashion. I'm going to show you, you know, driving with keystrokes, but you could automate it all with just a little bit of code. So it really just puts the flexibility of being able to change all your workloads around right at your fingertips. So whenever you look at any open source project, it's very, very important that you look at the community behind it. Because an open source project is really only good as the community that's working on it and supporting it. So the good news is with OpenStack, 
um, it, it's, a, it's a really large, healthy, diverse community. You have 25,000 developers. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a large number of developers who have worked at OpenStack at one point since its inception. You have 500 companies that are contributing or have contributed at one point in time to OpenStack. Over 20 million lines of code. I think I took that number a little while ago. I'm sure it's even much larger than that. And that's, uh, that's very impressive on the one hand. It's also a little frightening on the other hand. It's like, how do you deal with all this? And we'll talk about how you deal with it in the modular design of OpenStack. Um, but one of the things that's impressive to me is that with that large code base, all these different companies working on it, all these developers, the OpenStack community has been able to put out a stable release of OpenStack on this uh, six-month cycle. So basically every six months, they come out with a new release of OpenStack. And I thought that was pretty impressive. But now what we're actually doing is trying to reduce that down even further from six months to about four months, or actually 16 weeks. So starting with the next release, uh, we're cutting it down. The, the current release is called Newton. And the release before that was called Mataka. And what you might see here is that um, if you've been following OpenStack for a while, it's, it's alphabetical. They started with A and worked their way up. They were at Mataka, now Newton. The next release will be called Okada. And Newton came out in early October. And now based on this 16-week cycle that I talked about that's getting introduced, um, Akata is actually due to come out tomorrow. <laughs> so tomorrow will be a, an interesting day. Um, hopefully, it, 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 we, we hit that 16-week cycle. Um, to be honest, I think we're actually in pretty good shape. But um, you know, things can always go wrong last minute. But um, kudos to the team, really, for being able to pull that off. With the Newton release, uh, over 2,500 uh, developers contributed just to that release from over 300 companies just going into the one release. So again, very impressive. With the Newton release, this is really when you start to see OpenStack, I think, coming into its own. Because instead of adding a bunch of features and, and that type of thing, it was really based more on stability and deployability. It's like, hey, if we really want OpenStack to be useful, not just for proof of concepts, but for people to put mission critical workloads on it and rely on it, we need better scalability, we need better resiliency, and we need the whole user experience to be better because uh, OpenStack can be a little bit of a challenge to certainly to deploy and to manage and operate over time. So looking at the overall uh, design of OpenStack, I mentioned those 20 million lines of code, but uh, it, it's really a very modular design. Because when you look at OpenStack, you have a core set of services that, um, that are in the middle here. So you have your compute, which is called Nova. Your storage can be two different flavors of storage. You have Cinder, which does your block storage. And you have uh, Swift, which does object storage. And then you have Neutron, which does your networking. We'll be showing you the, I'll be showing you the Horizon CL, uh, UI. And that is called the, uh, that's your dashboard. That, that project's called Horizon. And then there's a whole bunch of other services as well that you can enable or, or not, depending on what it is you're trying to do. What are the workloads you're trying to run up? Um, what are the, what's the functionality that you need? Now, moving up, these are those APIs that I talked about that are very important. Uh, again, what OpenStack's going to do is take all the resources that are being provided by these uh, core components in the middle and they're all going to be distracted, um, abstracted across this common API that you have access to. You have REST APIs, you have the CLI, you have SDKs that you can use with Python and other languages to get access to all those. And then you can build your applications and services on top of that. Another key thing is the infrastructure plugins, because at the end of the day, not everything can be virtual. At some point, you do need to tie to some real physical hardware and network equipment and that type of thing. So that's where these infrastructure plugins come in. So depending on what your underlying uh, virtual and physical infrastructure is, you can use different plugins. I like to think of the plugins similar to like a device driver on your laptop. That's what's going to take the operating system that you're running and tie it to like the physical hardware of your laptop. That's what these infrastructure uh, plugins do. They tie it to your 
underlying uh, physical resources on which you're running OpenStack. So I mentioned there were a lot of other projects, and what I had only shown you were like these core projects. This is just to give you an idea of some of the other projects that exist, and actually uh, there, there's a lot more than this. But as you can see, if, if, if uh, like database resources were really important to you in your, your cloud, you would probably use Trove. If they're not important, you wouldn't use it. Um, similarly, if... Uh, Let's say for data processing, if you're going to be doing a lot of that, you might use Sahara. The key being that what you're going to do is you're going to pick and choose the components that are important to you, and you're going to include those or not include those. So really, no one's using all 20 million lines of code when they deploy OpenStack. They're using some subset that's, you know, that makes sense for them. So I talked about there being a, a lot of contributors to OpenStack. And again, when you look at an open source project, you really, want, um, you really want contribution coming from a wide base. If all the contributions coming from like one or two companies, that, that's kind of a warning sign. And then you got to get nervous because it's, sure, it's an open source project, but it's really being dominated by a couple interests. Fortunately, with OpenStack, you don't see that at all. If you look at the left-hand side, this is contributions by company. And what you'll see is the largest one, that 26%, that's actually from others <laughs> because it's like a bunch of uh, small contributions from various companies. The largest contributor, um, this is just for the Newton release, uh, was Morantis. And you can see them coming in at 19%, Red Hat at 16 and then uh, a bunch of others contributing significantly as well. So you see a good mix of contribution coming from a, a bunch of different companies, which is really good to see. Uh, similarly, if you look at where are they contributing, another important thing with an open source project is if you have thousands of developers, but they all need to change the same like 500 lines of code, then it all has to be done in serial, right? While you wait for one person to do their thing and the next person. Again, fortunately with OpenStack, that's not the case at all you actually have people contributing across a whole bunch of different projects where you can see Nova was the largest, um, the project people contributed to the most. That's only 7%, right? And again, the, the big one, the 67% is other. That's, those, those are projects to which, it's a whole bunch of small projects to which people contributed like 2% or less of the code. So you really see um, contributions coming all across these many, many different projects. And that means everything can run in parallel. And then just near the end of the release cycle, you pull it all together uh, to integrate it together as a release. So uh, that's really important because the way the components are communicating with each other is through these same APIs that I were telling you are so valuable. That's how Nova will talk to Neutron. That's how Neutron will talk to, uh, uh, say, to, um, um, to, to Horizon to display the network. So those same APIs get used across the board, and that really makes it easy for development to happen in parallel. Now, just looking specifically where Cisco is contributing, on the left-hand side, it's where it's all time where Cisco has contributed. And then on the right-hand side is just with this latest release with Newton. And as you might expect, if you look at all time where Cisco's contributed, you see 39% to Neutron, which is, as you might expect, the, the networking component. That, that's sort of what you would expect and makes sense. Looking at the uh, latest release, Newton, you see the majority of the contribution a lot to Horizon, which is the, uh, the user interface, uh, a lot to Cola. How many of you have heard of Cola? Okay, I'm going to talk about Cola a little bit more. What, Contola, what Cola is, is um, making it so that you can deploy OpenStack using containers. So it's really a bunch of tools to help you uh, deploy and manage your OpenStack cloud using containers. And so uh, Cisco's contributing significantly there. Okay, now we're going to talk a bit about why you might want to use OpenStack and where people are using OpenStack. So initially when OpenStack first came into being, people were thinking of AWS and kind of an AWS replacement. Yeah, we can use OpenStack to, to run a, a public cloud. 
And you certainly can, and there are a few people doing that. Uh, Rackspace is doing that, NTT is doing that. Um, OpenStack was originally built to do that, so sure, a lot of, um, there's, there are some people doing that. But uh, where you're really seeing the traction with OpenStack is in the private cloud. And the idea being here is that you want to get all those benefits that I talked about of having everything behind the APIs, programmatic access to it, but you want to still have it be private and just for your own company. And it could be a small company with maybe 10 people, could be a really large company with, with, with thousands of people, and OpenStack can, can scale to meet your needs. Just a, a couple examples on the left. Anyone recognize what that picture is? Yeah, it's, it, it's CERN. They do uh, uh, particle physics. So they're, they're you know, making these particles go really, really fast and smashing them together. And when that happens, there's a lot of information they want to be able to collect and then analyze. So they use OpenStack to be able to uh, you know, uh, with very quickly create like huge amounts of resources that they need to first capture the information and then later on churn on it. So they're, they're you know, varying their workloads over time. Uh, Comcast, they run their Xfinity service on it. And SAP, SAP runs SAP as a service on OpenStack. So just some examples of where it's being used today. Now, how Cisco is using it, because uh, OpenStack does find its way into some of Cisco products. And these range from kind of a, a do-it-yourself type of solution, where Cisco will just uh, sell you the, uh, the product and the software and let you run off with it, like uh, with a Cisco design, or can offer a managed service. So if you actually want a managed service, that's where MetaCloud would come in. And so that is OpenStack private cloud as a service. So you will get Meta, the MetaCloud team will, will run an OpenStack private cloud for you for your enterprise. So you don't have any of the hassle of running it, you just get all the benefits of using it. Another option for, for the enterprise is you can use UCS servers with Red Hat OpenStack on top of it and you can deploy that. And so we have reference designs that make it you know, straightforward for you to do that, but you're going to be responsible for the deployment. You're going to be responsible for managing it. Similarly, for service provider, um, a big thing in the service provider industry right now is NFEI, this infrastructure for network function virtualization. And so what Cisco has is using OpenStack to power our NFEI solutions for mobility, for media, and also just for running generic uh, network, uh, virtualized network functions. And then we have orchestrators that you can use, um, including Open Daylight, which is an open source orchestrator. Uh, and then you can use ACI, NSO, ESC, VTS. These, these are just orchestrators that you can use on top of your OpenStack deployment. Okay, so now I want to just shift back to why is OpenStack getting the traction and the excitement around it uh, that it is. And I'm just going to, I've mentioned it before, but I'm going to mention it again, it's really the APIs. The APIs that it provides are the key. And with that comes the speed and flexibility of being able to spin up uh, and change your workloads as you need over time. There is a huge cost savings, of course, that comes with that, because now you don't need to have dedicated hardware for just one solution, and then when that starts to not be necessary, you just have this you know, kind of machine sitting idle. You can repurpose it very easily for another workload, so you do get a cost benefit there. And the programmatic workflows, that has a lot to do with the speed. But then this open and broadly interoperable, this is really a key, too. The reason why you see so many people contributing to OpenStack is a lot of people have their own kind of special needs and or hardware that they sell or network equipment that they sell, something that they want to integrate in with OpenStack. And because it is a very, it's an open source project, they can go and they can say write a, a driver for OpenStack so it plugs in with whatever infrastructure they're providing. Or they can write applications using those open APIs that do something useful. So when you look at OpenStack, it's really become, I would say, like a cloud platform where people are innovating and integrating in at different points. And, and that's really a big part of its success. 
Now, there are some challenges with OpenStack, and fortunately, some of these are, are, were addressed already with the Newton release. Um, the security model, I wouldn't say that it's not secure, but I would just say that it, it's perhaps a little bit difficult as an operator to know everything you need to do. We're still learning some lessons there as people deploy this and, uh, and trying to make it easier for you to deploy it securely. There has historically been a, a lack of operational tools to, to manage your OpenStack cloud, not only to deploy it, which is complicated, but then to, over time, how do you upgrade it and keep everything up and running while you're at the same time upgrading the underlying version uh, behind some of your components. So that's been difficult. And so what I'm going to talk about next is something that really goes after this, the, the operational tools and the complexity of deploying and managing your OpenStack cloud. So that's where the containerized deployment of OpenStack comes in. You've probably heard a lot about containers in other sessions here in the industry. It, it, it certainly is a hot topic. And the idea here is that we want to get the benefits that containers provide and, and bring that to our OpenStack deployment, make it easier for us to deploy OpenStack and to manage it over time. Why containers? I already sort of alluded to this. The idea is that containers can really help you when you have any type of large, complex, um, distributed system. And OpenStack is definitely one of those. As we, sh we saw, it's great that it's very modular. Everything's kind of broken up into these different components. But it's a lot to, to manage. So uh, OpenStack can help out there. It, it can bring you some some speed in terms of and flexibility in terms of how do you deploy, how do you manage, how do you spin up more instances of a certain component when you need it, how do you upgrade components. All, containers makes all of that a lot easier. So we're getting all the benefits of containers, and I'll show you how we bring that to OpenStack. So the technology used or the project within OpenStack that's addressing this is, is COLA. And the mission statement of COLA is to have uh, production-ready containers and tools to deploy and operate your OpenStack cloud. What COLA uses is um, Docker. Basically, it builds a bunch of Docker containers, one for each of the components within it. And then you use Ansible and Ansible playbooks to, uh, to orchestrate this deployment and to manage it over time to validate that everything's working and to change things over time and upgrade as you need to. So maybe it'd be a little bit more straightforward if I talk to a picture. So on the left-hand side, let's take all, all that open uh, stack source code, the 20 million plus lines of code. What Cola is going to do is take that, take each component and build a Docker container for it. So for Glance, you get a, um, a container. For Nova, you get a container. For Neutron, you get a container. Sometimes you actually get multiple containers for each one. If, if it can be further subdivided, that just makes, the more you can break it down, the more flexibility it gives you to, to manage it over time. So you get all these different components of OpenStack built as containers, and you build out a full Docker registry with that. Now, once you have your Docker registry, then you can use Ansible. And with Ansible, you're going to pick and choose exactly which components you want and how many of them and what version. And you're going to deploy that on your target infrastructure. And this is really where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where your OpenStack deployments meeting with your physical and virtual infrastructure. And then the key thing is you're not just getting Ansible playbooks to deploy initially, but you're also getting them to manage and monitor things over time. So you can deal with upgrades. You can deal with uh, growing your OpenStack uh, cloud as, as you want to over time. OK. So now I'm going to shift gears a bit. Since we are in the DevNet zone, um, we want this to be a, a little bit more a little bit more hands-on. So what I'm going to do is show you a learning lab that we have within DevNet. How many of you have ever run a DevNet learning lab? OK, well, by the end of this week, yeah, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more of you who have run a DevNet learning lab. So our learning labs, we have a whole bunch of them. They're all free. Um, and they help you get your hands on with certain bits of technology. And this is just one of them. 
the idea is within this learning lab, uh, what we've done is we've, we've taken a Linux VM and we've put OpenStack within it uh, using Cola, so we're deploying OpenStack within containers. And that's within a VM that you can download and access. And then the learning lab walks you through how, how you would take that and uh, interact with it once you have it up and running, both as an administrator or as an end user. The way we do this is we use VirtualBox. VirtualBox is just a really handy tool. It's also free and open source. It's available and, and helps you run VMs. So you take the VM that, that we provided, you download it, you also download VirtualBox and you install VirtualBox. Once you've installed VirtualBox, it's very important that you install the extension packs too that come with VirtualBox because we're going to use those. Then you go into VirtualBox, you configure some networks, and I'm going to kind of run through some of this for you. And um, once you've done that, then you import your, um, the VM that we provided into VirtualBox, you associate the networks, and you boot it up. And the URL down here at the bottom, this is you know, step one. It's going to take you through step by step how to do this. So don't worry about capturing it now, because you can go and download the slides, and you can go and do this learning lab on your own afterwards. This is showing you what it's going to look like when you navigate to the learning lab. The left-hand side is the actual um, within the learning lab code. And when you click on log in to start, and you do have to log in, so you're going to need a DevNet account, which hopefully you have already. If not, hopefully this convinces you you should get one. Um, so then you can go and run this learning lab. And this is just showing you here how to set up your virtual box uh, networks like I was just describing. And it goes through in detail, tells you exactly everything you need to do. It's pretty straightforward. When you're setting up the networks, um, what I thought would be helpful to show here is the different networks that are involved with, with OpenStack. So in blue here, this is the API network. This is how you're going to come in. And when I'm typing OpenStack commands or when, I'm, or, or when you're writing Python code that's going to come in and, and, and do something, call one of the OpenStack APIs, it'd be coming in on that network. Now, internal to OpenStack, it has its own management network. And that's the orange network there. And that's what the controller node is going to use to configure all the compute nodes that you need and all the network nodes that you need. You can imagine in your OpenStack cloud, um, depending on if, you're, if you don't need much networking and you're really compute intensive, you're going to have a lot of compute nodes and not too many network nodes. If you need you know, more complex networking, then you'd spin up more network nodes. But this is how the controller will interact with all those and manage them over time is over the management network. Once you start to spin up virtual machines that are actually doing something, they will communicate with each other on the data network in gray there. And typically within your cloud, everything is internal to your cloud, kind of like your own private network. But if you do need to get to the outside and connect to whatever your public network is, then that's what this external network uh, near the bottom is. And that'll go out the OpenStack router and out to the outside world. So just showing you a bit of what the networks are that are in play here. And you're going to see when you look at VirtualBox that you're setting up these different networks within it. OK, so now I'm going to break out of slideware mode. And we're going to look at stuff that I think is a little more interesting. <laughs> so this is my VirtualBox um, that I've downloaded and installed. Let's see, that's a little bit small. Um, there, hopefully you can see that a little bit better. So, and here is the VM. It's called Cisco Live Kala uh, Mataka. That, that's because it's actually the Mataka release that I'm running. So I can go ahead and start this. And now this is my uh, VM that has my OpenStack deployment in it, deployed using Kala, starting up. So it should only take a minute or two. So I decided to um, really take, take some chances with the demo and um, and just do everything, do everything live and hope it works out OK. So we'll see how far we get. OK, so fortunately, it, it uh, starts up pretty quick. 
and the credentials to log in are OS Dev and Cisco DevNet, and these are all in the learning lab. Okay, so now I'm into my VM, and I'm just gonna type ifconfig and pipe that to more just to see what my IP address is. Because I actually, if, if you've ever tried using VirtualBox or any type of virtualization software, it can be a little clunky within the user interface of the virtual machine. What I like to do is find my virtual, find my IP addresses and then connect uh, like SSH into them or just uh, HTTP into them and then it's, it's a lot better user experience. So, okay, so here's my IP address. Uh, 10, 200, 200 10. So that's what I'm gonna connect to. So let me get out of there. And I will go ahead and return to normal screen. And I'm gonna try connecting to my, my brand new OpenStack uh, deployment. Let me try to make this a little bit bigger. 10, 200, 200. Dot 10. Okay, so it connected. I'm actually surprised it didn't ask me to log in. Let me, let me show you what you should see. Okay, you should come to this screen. And then once you get to this screen, you can log in. And the username is admin, and the password is password. Real inventive. Whoops, if you type it right, it works. So now I'm connecting in as the administrator. And I mentioned you have different users within OpenStack. You have the administrator. So right now I'm in, I'm in charge of the whole OpenStack deployment, right? And I can see everything that's in it. So for example, if I go to my projects, I can see I have two projects. I have a project called admin and I have a project called service. And let me go ahead and just make this bigger. Can you guys see that all right? Is the resolution okay? Yeah? Okay. If I take an overview, I can see, all right, I have, th this is what's been allocated for this project. I have the ability to start up to 10 instances. Uh, right now I have one that's running. I can have up to 20 uh, CPUs. I have a certain amount of RAM I'm able to use. Floating IPs, anyone have an idea what floating IPs are for? Floating IPs are how we get from our private network out to the public network and how we map between the two. So if we have time, we'll, we'll take a look at that. And security groups, that's basically how I, when I spin up a VM, I can say, I really want it to be locked down or I want it to be a bit more open. I can specify what ports are open on it. You can create different security groups to do all that. Okay, so. Let me take a look also at as the administrator. I want to see what users I have here. Um, sorry. Okay, so now I'm looking at my instances. Th these are the VMs that I have up and running. And I can see this VM actually didn't start up very well. So I'm gonna get rid of that and we're gonna try to start up another one. But actually, before I even do that, I wanna show you the projects that I have. I should have a list of projects. Sorry. Okay. 
Let's look at this instead. So sorry, I, I'm looking at my administrator project. And I mentioned you have uh, private networks and you have public networks. So I'm just looking at the network topology associated with this project. And this worldly looking type thing over here, this is my public network. I also have a private network. And I have a router connecting the two. So a pretty simple network. But typically what we would do with an OpenStack is when we spin up a VM, we would connect it to the, um, to the private network. And so everything would be on the private network, all the data, we saw the data network, all that's on the private network, that's all staying internal. And if there's certain things we need to expose, we expose them to the public network using floating IPs. So you can imagine like if I have uh, my application, I have some database resources, all that would be private and I just put that on the private network. If I have a web server and I want people to actually access that from the outside, it would be on the private network too, but I would expose it by connecting a, a float by, through a floating IP to give access to the public network. That way someone from the outside could come in. And that way I can control exactly what people are accessing. Okay. Sorry, I'm just gonna log in again. Okay, so I have my two projects here, and I also have a set of users. And you can see all these users, these are users that were created as part of my deployment. So now for illustrative purposes, what I wanna do is go ahead and create another user for myself. Because typically when you're in here, you wouldn't be starting a bunch of VMs as the admin, you would typically be starting them as a user who has been given some portion of the cloud. So I'm gonna create a user for myself. I'm gonna use the same credentials, password, and I'm going to say that I should be allowed to use that admin project. So this will give me access to the admin project, and I'm a member of the project. So let's go and create a new user. I was created, okay. And now as the administrator, because I'm still logged in as the administrator, remember, I can go and I can change things about this user. But I'm not gonna do that. Instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna log out, because I shouldn't be in here as the admin, and I'm gonna log back in as myself, as Charles, as this new user that I just created. And the reason I'm showing you this is so you can see how easy it is to create users, assign them to projects. You can imagine typically you would have maybe five different projects and you would assign different users to different projects uh, to let them do things. So now I'm logged in as myself. I have access to the project. I can see all the resources here that I'm allowed to work with. And if I go back and take a look at the network, the network topology, see it's the same network. This is the network we saw before with our, our public and private, because it's the same project. But now I have the ability to, to play with it as uh, the user Charles. So what I'm gonna do is go in and let's create our first VM. So I say I wanna launch an instance and I will call it, uh, we'll call it DevNet zone one and I need to tell it what image I want it to boot up and Cirrus is a very scaled down version of Linux, very small version of Linux. I'm going to use that. It's handy for these types of things where you're, you're running uh, everything on like one laptop <laughs> so you don't kill your laptop. So it's kind of handy for testing out. I have to say how big I want the instance to be. And I'm going to tell it I want it to be a tiny, M1 tiny. This is uh, known as, in OpenStack, they're known as flavors. Basically, the flavor is how big of a VM do you want. Do you want a giant VM with a lot of cores, or do you want a re relatively small VM? And here I want a, a tiny, tiny VM that's pretty useless. It's just good for illustrative purposes. And I'm going to connect it to the, the private network because I don't want everyone to be able to get at it. I want it just for my use. 
And I could also give it network ports. I could give it a security group. You can see here it's assigned to that default security group. And we'll take a look at that later, too, to see what that does. So anyways, let's go ahead and let's try launching our first VM. So it's spinning up, telling me the state of it. And if all goes well, once it's done spinning up, it'll tell me that it's up and running. OK, so now it's running. Here's the IP address. I can click on it, and I can go and see some more details about it. This is basically telling me, you know, OK, here's the flavor that I did, M1Tiny. Here's the size of it. Here's its IP address. Here's the, the security group rules, right? And what this is telling me is that basically uh, SSH into it and ICMP into it are available. So I should be able to ping it. I should be able to SSH to it. OK, so now I spun up one VM. Now I want to show you, this is using the graphical user interface. But there's another way to interact with OpenStack, and that is using the CLI. So I'm going to show you how to use the CLI. Make this a little bit bigger. And now I'm going to SSH to the same credentials that I used before, OS dev, and the IP address that we said was 200.200.10. So I'm going to SSH to that. OK, now I'm, I'm in my OpenStack cloud. And if I take a look here, there's a file called OpenRC. And what that is is. Inside of it, it's just a handy little thing. It has the credentials I need in order to interact with the CLI. So you can see in here what it's going to do if I make it a little bit bigger. This is going to log me in as the admin. Here's the credentials, password, my, my insecure password for this demo. Here's how to access the CLI. It's on this IP address and port 500, whereas when I access through the GUI, right, that was using uh, port 8080. And so what I'm going to do is source this file. And now I have access to all the OpenStack CLI commands. So for example, if I do OpenStack server, whoops, OpenStack server, I need to do list. What this does is it shows me all my VMs that are running. And right now I only have the one, right? DevNet zone one, that's the one I just started. I can also start uh, a, ser start a, um, a VM from here. And that command's called OpenStack Server Create. Now, I didn't give it any parameters, so it actually gave me an error. But here it shows me all the things I need to provide. What I need to provide are basically the exact same things that I, I provided um, uh, in the GUI. And one of the things I need to provide is my network. So I also need to find out what the, the, my networks are. So OpenStack network list. And here, remember, I have a public and private network. This is showing me that. So basically, everything I could do through the uh, graphical user interface, I can also do from the CLI. So let's try to create a VM now. Let's do OpenStack server create, and we need to give it a, a flavor, which is M1 tiny. I need to give it an image, which was Cirrus. And I need to give it a, let's see what it says. It says Nick net ID equals and let me give it the ID of this. This is, let me copy paste the ID of my private network. And let's give it a name. We're going to call it DevNet Zone 2. And oh, it looks like I did something wrong. What did I do wrong? Ah, I only did one dash before Nick. So you can see why some people find the uh, 
graphical user interface a little bit handier because you don't make these typos. <laughs> so this had a, effectively exactly the same effect on the OpenStack cloud as the, the command I ran before. It's trying to spin up a, a second VM with the same different name but the same credentials. So now if I go back and I look here at my instances, you can see I spun up uh, DevNet Zone 2. And similarly, if I do OpenStack server list here, I can now see both. So hopefully this is making it clear that, you know, th these are just two different ways of using the same OpenStack APIs. OK, next what we're going to do is we're going to go into one of these VMs. So let me go into um, this one here. I can take a look at the logs as to how it started up. In case there were any issues, I would see them here in the logs. Fortunately, it looks like it started up all right, and it tells me here the credentials even to get into it. Ciros is the username, and the password, CubsWin. So let me try that. I can go here to the console, and this will get me directly into my VM. Now, this is kind of tricky, so let me show you this. For some reason, you have to click on this little gray bar. Otherwise, your cursor won't work inside, inside here. So I, I do that. Now I can type Ciros. I can type Cubs win with a little smiley face. And I'm inside my VM. It's not a very exciting VM, but anyways, I'm inside of it. But now, what I want to show you is, let's say I, I want to access that from outside, right? I don't want to use this clunky interface. Let me go back to, my, to here, and let me try to access it. So what was the IP address? I forgot what its IP address was. Did anyone remember? Yeah, I'll go take a look at it from here. The IP address is here, 1010. So let me try to connect to it. SSH Ciros at. OK, and it's not responding. So does anyone know why it's not responding? Let me try to ping it. What's that? It, it, it's on the, uh, the private network, right? And I didn't expose it. So I need to do that. And we, I alluded to it before, but we didn't do it. The way to do that, like if I go back and look at my network, you'll see my VMs on the network now. But they're hanging off of this private network. What I need to do if I want to get at them is I need to expose them to the outside world. Whoops. Let's see. How do I get to? If I go here, access and security. So what I need to do is create one of these floating IPs. So I allocate one for my project, and I say this floating IP is to connect to the public network. I allocate it. And then I need to associate it with that VM. So I can click here, Associate, and there's my floating IP. I choose my VM. I want to use DevNet Zone 2. And I say Associate. So now what this is doing is saying, OK, if you're in the outside, use this IP address instead, 192.168.57.6. And if you use that, map it inside to 10, 10, 0, 16, and I should be able to access it. So if I come back here, you can see pinging still doesn't work, right? Because that's not the way in. The way in is to ping this IP address. See, so now I can ping it. If I can ping it, I should be able to SSH to it. And yes, I do want to talk to it. Oh, wait, the password was Cubs win. 
Okay, now you can see I'm inside. It's that same boring VM with almost nothing going on. Okay, so that's just to impress how the internal and external network works and how you as the administrator or as a user, right, can go in and, uh, and set up how that's supposed to work. Okay, so now in the interest of time, I'm gonna go out of demo mode because what I wanna do is show you how you can do this on your own and leave you with some additional resources. So first of all, within DevNet, we have what we call our open source dev center. And that's where we have information about all, everything going on open source at, at Cisco that's relevant to developers. Basically, anywhere Cisco's contributing significantly to open source, where we're using it in our products and services in ways that are relevant to developers. Inside that dev center, we have what we call microsites. And I'm just showing you an example of the OpenStack microsite. So this is where we have resources specific to OpenStack. Again, where Cisco's contributing, how we're using it in our products. You can find a table here that shows you all the integrations. I mentioned the open community aspect of uh, OpenStack and the way that different companies are able to do their own integrations in with it. Here's where you can see the integrations that Cisco's done. We have a forum where you can get help. But what I really wanted to leave you with was the, the learning lab. Because here's the link to the learning lab. Here's how you can go. I showed you this before on a different slide. But this is where you can get access to everything I'm doing here. The OVA file that you can download, the steps to download, configure, install VirtualBox, and set up all the networks. So you should be able to do that on your own. If you have any questions, I will be monitoring this um, uh, Spark chat room. You just look for the chat room with the uh, uh, the title of this course, DevNet 1000, uh, sorry, 11001. And then this is kind of my, my plea to you. Um, please do the session evaluation. If you hated this, um, I don't want to hear that really, but I would like to, it's better for me to know, right? So I can do something different next time. Um, if it worked well, let me know that too. Let me know what worked, what wasn't so good, what you'd like to see next time um, so that I can make valuable use of your time next time. And then here are some links where you can go and continue your own education. Um, this blog will show you all the different stuff related to open source that's going on in the DevNet zone this week. You can become a DevNet member and you can find the bottom ones, the uh, open source dev center that I showed you. And all these are uh, posted. You should be able to pull them down at the same place you scheduled uh, this session. And that's it. I think I have maybe three minutes for questions. Any questions? OK. Well, great. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you found this useful. Uh, enjoy the rest of Cisco Live. <laughs>